Hello, and welcome to another Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda Holt with Arizona AARP. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. And during another month of national caregiving, we will be reaching out to caregivers who find themselves in challenging positions of being a caregiver to offer you resources. And you can also find these resources on our website by visiting us at aarp.org backslash caregiving. Enjoy your tour. Be safe and be well. Well, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to Arizona History Happy Hour. Oh, my gosh. So happy that you've been able to join us on Thursday, December 16th. So have we got a fun night for you. So I want to welcome you all. I know some of you are out there watching on Twitch, Facebook, YouTube. I'm so happy that you've been able to join us as we get a chance to talk about a really cool event that's going on right now, as you can see by behind me. We're right in the middle of Festivus, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So, you know, today is not just a Thursday, not just December 16th. Oh, my gosh. So back in 1902. So, you know, there were these camels that went across northern Arizona and they were let, one of the leaders of that was or the camel caregiver was Haji Ali, who his name had been shortened to High Jolly just because I guess it was easier to say. And so he passed away this date back in 1902. Now, in the mid 30s, they actually then erected that famous pyramid that you can see in quartzite at the cemetery. So, and they've done a great job of remodeling and kind of revamping that whole area. So if you're ever up in Quartzsite, it's well worth a visit to go visit Haji Ali. And you'll see, you'll know it's him because he's the only pyramid in the entire cemetery. And there's a great camel on top of his marker. Now it's also La Posada, which is a nine day Latina holiday celebrating mainly in Hispanic countries Though it recently started to be recognized in the U.S., it's December 16th through the 24th and leads directly into Christmas and is really meant to celebrate Mary's pregnancy with each day representing a month. And it's also National Covered or National Chocolate Covered Anything Day because, you know, any well, except for an old shoe, an old shoe is not going to be better because it's dipped in chocolate, but Pretty much anything dipped in chocolate is pretty darn good. So now is a day where you can go and do just that and enjoy it. So it is also <laughs> national, basically Barbie and Barney kind of a revolt day where it's a chance for parents to get away from all those annoying toys, not just the ones that sing or have TV shows, but kind of all those that just make raucous noise that you can just get away with because you know what there's more coming you know several years ago it was funny um my in-laws decided um they would get one of the nieces the joke was any noisy toy available and so <laughs> her mom was not happy but it was a lot of fun all right. So what can you expect tonight? Well, you know, we always do just a touch of Arizona music history. We've got From the Vault, which is going to be kind of a, oh, you know, it's actually kind of a really cool story tonight. Actually, not cool story, but it's an interesting story. Um, and then we always do trivia as well as a little Arizona. And of course, we have a beverage and a special guest. So more about that in just a moment. Now, if this is your first time here, you might wonder, who is that man is? Why is he on my screen? Well, 
My name is Marshall Shore, and I got here almost 22 years ago to the day. Um, I was living in Brooklyn. I was working in a beautiful Carnegie building and decided to trade all that snow, that slush, that wind for a little library in South Phoenix called the Harmon Library. And there was this rich oral tradition of the community. And that really got me thinking, we need to talk more about what's happening now or recently. And, you know, that library no longer stands, but they now have really fa a fancy new modern library just down the street. So it's well worth checking out. Now, when we first moved to Phoenix, we promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch. And originally it was oh so many tones of beige. I'm happy to say now that it is seafoam and cantaloupe, just two colors. And pretty much the house is a time capsule. There's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile with matching appliances. Now, as soon as we got here, all we kept hearing about how there was no history here. But, you know, I found out really quickly that wasn't true because every time I went for an adventure, whether it was on a bike, in a car, on foot, I kept coming across so many amazing people, places, and stories. And that's pretty much how I got doing what I'm doing today. Now, there is that post-war boom where I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we all know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And how did I get the name The Hip Historian? And what does that mean? Well, basically, because we deal with modern history, I get to have lots of fun. Why, in fact, just this weekend, we are doing a downtown haunted history tour, walking. It's about two miles, two hours, and lots of fun. Um, coming up, we've also been doing for the last few months an LGBTQ story circle that is sponsored by Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture. So we'll be doing that the second Saturday of January. And then, of course, Festivus, which was running last night and tonight is the last night so if you're listening or watching you have till 10 o'clock to get here because i know we'll be here having all kinds of fun so come on down and join us now i see some of you have probably found the chat but you know if you don't get what you want in the chat you can also reach out via facebook instagram email or even via my website, hiphistorian.com. Now, if you are watching on Facebook, I'll ask you to click on that little share button down beneath so that way your friends can see how much fun we're having with Arizona history. Now, you know, I talk about being from New York, but I grew up in a little tiny town in the middle of Indiana. And so I have this kind of unique kind of relationship, I think, with small towns and their quirkiness. And I'm always amazed. It's always fun to just kind of research and explore. And so tonight we are going to be talking about, now I always mispronounce this. So Tumakakori. We're just going to go with that. I have a feeling someone will be like, you're butchering it. And I probably am. Now it's a little town. Actually, it's a site in Santa Cruz. Population just under 400, so a little bit of a space. And what it's famous for is the Tucumcari National Historic Park. Now, it's the site of the mission, the San Jose de Tucumcari, a Franciscan mission that was built in the late 18th century. It takes its name from an earlier mission that was there, built by Father Kino back in the late 1600s. And it eventually was closed due to just violence in the community. And so they left. I have a feeling this looks a lot like what San Javier del Bac looked like when they found it. There is very little that's been done to this. It just is preserved to stay standing. And then, you know, look, it's such a beautiful building and so worth going and spending some time just walking around and going through it. And then just steps away, there's the Avalon Organic Garden 
and Eco Village. It's one of the world's largest sustainable eco villages on 220 acres in Southern Arizona. More than a hundred folks are there dedicated to bringing together and creating a micro society showcasing more than 30 years of how they've incorporated sustainability into a modern lifestyle. And I can hardly wait to get a chance to go see those houses it looks like a really amazing i would it sounds it sounds kind of like almost like arco sante but i think it's very different so at least i can the end in the the goal is the same but the how do you get there a little different so all right oh and then across the street oh my gosh there is the rustic old bar right across the street which every time i've been by it's been in the daytime and so the bars never open I've got some friends who have been in and they said it is definitely a throwback to days gone by. I mean, they still have an A1 sign out front. So, you know, that tells you something. They're not really hip on let's remodel and let's redo it. So I really want to get down there and see what it looks like. And because it is happy hour, you know, PJ always comes up with something. And so tonight for Festivus, we're actually... You may think this looks like just a tin can. Oh. And you would be correct, but it is the special Festivus brew that is only available at Festivus. It is done by Phoenix Beer Company. It is brewed down on their space down near Washington. Oh, that's it's very, very holiday esque. Nice. So yeah, so PJ, um, you can told me that you can get this at Festivus. You can also get it at Phoenix Beer Company down on Washington after Festivus. The only two spots that you can get this, and it's only limited production. Once they're out, they are out. And it does taste like Christmas. So there's a lot of little flavors going on in there. All right, so now is when we get to have some fun because we have a very special guest, which I am so happy to bring to you. Just you wait. You're going to have, we're going to have so much fun. Hey, Dylan. Hello. How's it going? Good. And yourself? Good. I'm doing good. I'm happy to be here. So Dylan, for folks that might not know who you are, tell us a little about yourself without giving away too much because I know we've got some trivia coming up, so... D don't go talking about all the answers okay okay so i was uh born here in tempe arizona um i grew up in moreno valley california and then i moved back out here um for high school and then i've kind of been here ever since i mean i went away for college for a little bit but now i'm back just doing my art and pursuing my career in art and getting into arizona history with marshall <laughs> indeed <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I know we've got some trivia that you helped put together. So now our trivia is a little unique because it's multiple choice, but we don't just tell you, here's what the answer is and move on. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through all the trivia and all the options. Then we'll take a little bit of an Arizona music break, and then we'll start talking about the answers. And I think that's where the magic really happens. <laughs> so, because it's so much fun and just the whole learning process as the stories unfold. So first up, our question is, what was Betty H. Fairfax known for? A, athletics. B, ran a boarding house. C, an educator. Or D, a local artist. So Betty Fairfax was known for something. Which one of those was it? All right. Moving on to question two. Who was Cesar Chavez? A, was he a musician? B, an artist. C, an activist. D, an athlete. All right. So, you know, you might be able to guess which one this is, but that's part of the fun. <laughs> All right. 
How many colleges are a part of the Maricopa County Community College System? Is it A, seven, B, eight, C, 10, or D, 11? All right. How big is the Maricopa Community College System? All right. How many four-year universities are there in Arizona? Is it A, 10, B, 15, C, 75, or D, 125? How many four-year universities are there right here in Arizona? All right. Here we are at that halfway point. So which sport does not have a professional sports team right here in Arizona? A, football. B, ultimate frisbee. C, soccer. Or D, cycling. So while you're thinking about that, remember this is what does not have a professional sports team. All right. Where is the arts district in Phoenix? Is it A, Grand Avenue, B, Roosevelt Row, C, Marshall Way, or D, Downtown? Where is the arts district in Phoenix? All right. Oh, and Dylan, look, you made your way into a question. <laughs> look at that. So, you know, I bet no one will get this right, but you know, that's half the fun. So Dylan's family moved here because of A, escaping natural disaster. B, an ant contracting tuberculosis. <laughs> C, looking for warmer weather. Or D, an uncle playing football. All right. So everyone take a guess as why you think Dylan and his family moved here. All right. What immersive art experience did Dylan work for? Was it A, Phoenix Art Museum? B, Wonder Space? C, Think Art Gallery? Or D, Candidopia? So one of those is an immersive art experience that you can go visit today. And Dylan used to work there. And it's a really cool place. But more about that in a bit. All right. Nine. What artist had murals on both the Berlin Wall and right here in Phoenix on a wall? Actually, windows. All right. Was it A, Diego Rivera, B, Banksy, C, L. Mack, or D, Keith Herring? All right. So while you are trying to guess that, we're going to go on. And our last question, what mid-century modern designer Industrial designer, graduated from Carver High School in South Phoenix. Was it A, Jean-Louis, B, Charles Harrison, C, Julian Abley, or D, Paul Revere Williams? So while you are thinking about that, we are going to move on because we're going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break. And you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, oh my gosh, an old classic 1960s bar. So back in 1963, Andy Womack, who was a radio clown as well as a developer, he wound up building places like Arcadia. Um, he even built here in my neighborhood. And him and his wife decided that they wanted to open something over on 7th Avenue near Indian School. And it was going to be kind of a really classy French lounge. And they called it Chez Nou. Now, the building no longer stands, but it grew into offering live music and was a really cool and very dark destination for people to go into and enjoy. But why are we talking about that is because Womack, the builder and the opener and who had Shea New, there is a bar in town called the Womack that closed for a while. It is now opened up with some new folks running it. 
And so I was able to go last week and had so much fun. Um, they're going to have Roscoe, who used to play at the Womack. He is going to be playing here. I think they said every Saturday night. So you can still get a touch of that. Um, it looks like a really old lounge when you walk in. The cocktails are all very classic and have great names like the Sinatra, as well as they have a menu. You know, sadly, I didn't realize there was going to be food or I wouldn't have eaten before I went because it looked really good. So you might be wondering, well, where is the Womack? Oops. And it is right there at 7th Street and Palo Verde, kind of that southeast corner. So well worth a little visit. Oh, that's funny. And you know, it's 10 minutes from where I live. Ha, ha, ha. All right. So, you know, the Womack is well worth checking out as things are opening up and we're having a lot more fun. And that's why we're having Festivus again for the 12th year. And it's back in person and then going to be going online. All right. So what was Betty Fairfax known for? Uh, she was an, an educator. I know this. And why do you know that? Because I went to Fairfax High School. That's where I graduated from. So where is Fairfax High School? It's out in Levine on 59th Avenue and Baseline. Uh, okay, I know there. I know there's a library out there. So yes, yes, that one is uh, the library is down the street actually. Mm. Okay, cool. Oh, so you so you used to live out there, and I'll, I mean that was pretty much like horse country not that long ago. Yeah, yeah. It seems like every time I go back out there, too, they're adding more to it, and it seems like it's developing a lot more. But yeah, there was a lot of just like open land and farms when I was out there. Yeah, and it's quick, and you're right, and it is very much quickly changing. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to question two Who was Cesar Chavez? And as we all know, he was an activist dealing a lot with labor rights. And why did you ask this question? Um, I just, I know of Cesar Chavez. I know of him being an activist, but I know of the high school C Cesar Chavez and I, they were, it's located like the way they're set up is Fairfax is literally like two blocks away from Cesar Chavez on the same street baseline. And so they were like our big rivals in high school always like, cause I played sports and so, they were always like our big rivals. Oh, that is funny. I didn't realize that the two high schools are rivals out there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, they're literally like right down the street and they call it like the battle of baseline. The battle. Of, so Dylan, which do you think is the better school? Oh, uh, you know, biasly speaking, I'm going to have to say Fairfax. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Very good. I was <laughs> like, there is no right answer. <laughs> All right, so how many colleges are there in the Maricopa County Community College System? And there are 10 colleges in the county system. And, you know, and I think they're celebrating 100 anniversary. So they've been, around, they've been around for a long time. Yeah, I actually, so I went to Phoenix College. That's where I went to our college. Oh, I didn't, oh wow. That's a beautiful campus. Yeah, it is. I feel like it's one of the older ones. It is. I mean, some of those buildings are just, I mean, and well, even some of the newer buildings are really cool. I mean, the library space is really nice, a newer yeah. building, but like the auditorium is classic. So, yeah, no, I mean, it's a great space out there. All right. So, how many four year universities are there in Arizona? And, you know, there are 15, I mean, if you start counting all the different campuses, you might getting it into a larger number. Um, there are also lots of other degree programs. You also have now the fact that America Open Community Colleges now offer bachelorette programs. So I'm, I'm always excited to see there's more education opportunities right here in Arizona because we, we definitely need it. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you mentioned like the smaller schools like uh, Arizona Christian and um, I know there's another one, Ottawa, because those those are where I had opportunities to go to after I finished at PC. And so I feel like the smaller schools don't really get enough appreciation, but they're definitely there for opportunities for people. 
Well, yeah, and I think that's I think that's important because I mean, not everybody wants to go to an ASU where right. you have maybe a lecture hall with uh, a lecture in it. So possibly a hundred students, where you get that those smaller colleges give you that more hands on. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I've got friends um, that work with UAT, um, University of Techno Advanced Technologies. And so, again, that very small, intimate classroom setting where you get to know the instructors and really develop in a different way than what you can develop, I think, on a larger campus. Right. And so. All right. All right. So which sport does not have a professional sports team in Arizona? And it's cycling because indeed we do have an ultimate Frisbee team, which I didn't realize. I thought that was really funny that we've got the Arizona Sidewinders. <laughs> so beyond yeah, football, basketball, which everybody knows, the fact that we've got so much other sports, I think <laughs> is really cool. Yeah, that's a good fun fact. I never knew that. So yeah, so I'm kind of intrigued. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued. Are there spectators when they do the right, side winders? Like How do they do that? <laughs> and I, I didn't, I didn't look into it to see if they have like an official field where they practice and everything else, or even how big the team is. Right. I just think that's kind of fun. All right, now this people may be up for debate because where is the arts district in Phoenix? And if you ask initially, it is going to be Roosevelt Row because that's been the traditional arts district for quite some time, hosting First Fridays, starting that, gosh, I think 20 years ago or more. Yeah, but doesn't and, it does um, like span over to Grand Avenue as well, doesn't it? It well, I mean the art the arts district as it's designated by the city is still Roosevelt, but yeah. I th I agree. I think a lot of people would argue that it's starting to move out to Grand Avenue. Because you really, I mean, with the redevelopment of Roosevelt, you have a lot of folks now opening galleries out on Grand Avenue. Right, yeah. So, I mean, you got Hazel. I feel like there's a... Up. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of fun stuff on Grand. Yeah, I feel like there's like almost its own First Friday within itself on Grand. So do you have a favorite gallery or anything where you like to go and that you kind of trust to know, well, they're going to have good stuff? Yeah, I like the Eye Lounge a lot. I know like a couple of the curators there. I worked with them at Wonder Spaces, and they always have like good shows whenever whenever they do. Yeah, no, I mean, I really kind of appreciate um, the quality of some of the art that gets shown. Yeah, I mean, and you've got there's so many great little spaces along Grand Avenue as well, and so that's always fun. I mean, you got Five Fifteen. Um, it's just kind of fun. And there's also, I know, and even there's even more food options now on Grand. I right, mean, you're starting yeah. to get, there's a, a brew company out there as well. So yeah, um, it seems like it's getting like, it's moving. Like every time I just pass by, there's always people just out walking and enjoying their day. I like seeing it. Yeah. And oh my gosh, there is, oh, and I'm blanking on the name. There's the, the ice cream donut place where you can go get a donut with ice. It's like an ice cream sandwich, but they use a hot donut. Oh, novel. It's novel ice cream. It's one of those little houses there. Um, I forget the new, the name of the new restaurant that went in there, but it's in one of those small houses just north on Grand. Okay. So maybe a little too cold for ice cream, but how about a hot donut? <laughs> Who doesn't love a nice it's never too donut? cold for ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and the art, and it, you know, and First Fridays, even though ArtLink has not been doing First Fridays due to the pandemic, a lot of galleries have just said, you know, we're going to open up and do it. Right. So, I mean, the last couple of months, because of the cooler weather, have been really good. Yeah. I mean, they've been pulling out some great shows, and it's great to see people out and about. Yeah, I feel like, like, you know, since the pandemic and everything, like, recently has been probably the most active. Oh, and then there's a new restaurant in Bags Pry Factory that just got rated by someone as like one of the top restaurants in the country. I'm um, called Bacanora, which I haven't been to yet because every time I go, it's too late and they're already booked up. So eventually I will make it out there to Bacanora because it sounds really interesting. All right. Mm 
So, Dylan, why did your family move here? Uh, we moved here because my uncle, he got an opportunity or an offer to play at ASU. And so he took it. And my family just all kind of migrated with him. And so that's how we ended up out here. And that's how I was born out here. And then after that, we moved back to California. But, yeah, it's kind of what brought us here. Um, yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so your uncle played football for ASU. Yes. Did he play football after that? Yeah, so he was drafted from ASU uh, in the sixth round in um, 1995. Oh, wow. Okay. So now you had mentioned you had played sports. Did you play sports? Yeah, I played football as well. That was actually, like, the main reason I played football. Um, I feel like it was something that was kind of, like, expected of me growing up was to play football and do that but after i started doing art it kind of just took over my life and i fell in love with it and it kind of just took over my passion for sports or for football oh wow all right yeah so now where did you where did you play football uh, so i played i played in high school at fairfax and then i also played for phoenix college and then after phoenix college i played at oklahoma panhandle university Ah, uh, okay. So, oh, so that's when you left Arizona was to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So after that, I went there and then I came back here after that. Ah, very good. All right. And then, and then kind of the arts took over and I'm yeah. kind of wondering if our next question kind of leads into that. What immersive art experience did you work for? So yeah, Wonder Spaces. Wonder Spaces have been like a big part of my life, honestly. It was crazy that I came into Wonder Spaces at a time where like I was looking for a job because I did, didn't want to get any job like right out of college. I didn't want to just like pick any job that didn't have to do with what I wanted to do. And so I was just like looking for different art opportunities. And sure enough, Wonder Spaces like came across my plate and I applied, got the job, and literally it's been like one of the best experience, like working experiences I've ever had. Just the people there, the environment. Um, it's a great way to like just stay creative uh, on the side while still pursuing my own career. Because everybody there is like so understanding and everybody's artists, everybody's creatives, and it's just a good environment. So explain Wonder what Wonder Spaces is for some folks that may not know what it is. Yeah, so it's a immersive art experience. Um, I believe they show like 13 different installations at a time. And so they basically take like all these different public installations and they turn it into like a museum for everybody to have access to. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I mean, I Wonder Spaces is great. Um, I know when I was there, there was an exhibit. Um, one of the exhibits was a virtual reality like dinner party yeah where you sat down at this table put some goggles on and you were sitting sun suddenly in someone's living room <laughs> at a little party right yeah as, as that started to unfold yeah i know the vr was very popular like the, we do showcases one wonder spaces does showcases to where it's just the vr and like people will come in just for the vr and we'll do like four different ones at a time Oh, wow. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. That would be fun. You know, it was funny. I was talking to some friends and they were talking about how through the pandemic, the sale of headsets for VR have gone way up. Yeah. So VR might be reaching a tipping point where it might actually become something that more people are doing as opposed to just playing video games on their TV, but now right. doing a lot of different things. Yeah, um, I'm excited really cool. to see what happens with it, honestly. Yeah, I like I, enhance a lot of experiences like video games or like movies even television well and like i've got one friend she's um working with asu in gamifying education so it's how do you how do you bring some of that technology into the education realm wow yeah which i think will be really interesting um i think probably one of the best experience i had while i was at wonder spaces was there was a young there was a family that showed up and they had a teenage child who was very emo, who when they walked in, you could tell would much rather have been anywhere else on the planet than there with mom, dad, and siblings. Yeah. 
And the work was you had this horizon and there was a ball in front of it. Yeah. And so as I'm walking away, I tell the mom, pick up the ball. And as she picks up the ball, the ball was then the sun. And so the entire horizon changes depending on where the sun is shining. And the, the emo kid, his face lit up. <laughs> it was so great to see that moment of this aha moment where he was like, oh, this is the most boring thing I've ever done. Right. Yeah, that's then that's one of the great things about working there was be able to like just like change people's whole perspective on art. I feel like it's like a good introductory. Like if you're not into art, that's a great place to go and get into it because you don't have to know much about art to be able to enjoy the installations there. When it's all and right, and I agree. I mean, I think it's it's so engaging and the fact that it's not just sitting there looking at like, oh, look at this work of art. Well, what right. does this evoke out of you? It's like you're there in the moment and you're just enjoying it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I think Wonder Spaces is really cool. Yeah. All right. So what artists had murals on both Berlin Wall and in a, on a Phoenix window? And that would be Keith Herring. So, yeah, so back in 1986, he was actually here. He did an ex There was one of his works that was actually at the art museum. And so he came in to do a drawing class with kids. And they discover, he basically said, you know, where's all your public art? And we were getting ready for the Fiesta Bowl. And so like, oh, we're going to have a parade. We should have some public art. So he worked with a bunch of students from South Mountain High to actually create and you can kind of see in the background a little bit of that mural. Oh, wow. So, yeah. I mean, sadly, the mural is now gone. There's all this kind of mystery that shrouds it in terms of what happened to it. Where did it wind up? So still trying to kind of unravel that. Oh, that would have been so cool to see today. So, you know, if, so what I will do also. So I have video that one of the teachers at the mountain, South Mountain took. And it's about 10 minutes of him working with all the kids. Oh, wow. Because he, he did projects. They actually used to have one of the columns at the school was decorated by him as well as one of the doors. Man, yeah, I would have loved to gone to South Mountain High School during that time. Uh, Keith Herring is like one of my biggest inspirations as an artist. If you were to check out my artwork, what you should do. It's and how would people do that? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of my art is kind of inspired by Keith Haring. And I think if you look at it, you can definitely tell. Oh, very much so. I know it was it was so funny when I when I walked into your gallery for the first time, I was like, I was like very much got that vibe. And so yeah. I think that maybe how we started talking was just it's like, hey, you know, Keith Haring, what do you know? And so <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, so we don't really know exactly what happened to all the mural, but we're always looking. So if anybody out there knows more information, would love to hear what you have and the stories we can tell about Keith Harry, because he also befriended some local artists here as well. Oh, uh, yeah. And became good yeah. friends with them. Yeah, we got to find some stories about that. So, indeed, and I'm sure we will. All right. And question 10, what mid-century modern des industrial designer graduated from Carver High School? And that would be Charles Harrison. Now, really, the reason why we even go into this question is because it's Festivus and I'm so excited. I've been wanting to do this for several years and Dylan made it happen. So this is one of the bags and we'll actually have these at Festivus. Oh, there we go. So we'll have shirts and bags. And so that is Charles Harrison. Now I already knew that people will not know who he is. And so with Thaddeus, my silk screener, we were able to then do a QR code that you'll be able to, now that QR codes are so popular during the pandemic, you'll be able to go onto that and there'll be a short video that explains who Charles Harrison is. 
and some of the things he designed. Like, as you see in this photo, that classic Viewmaster. I mean, I know I had one as a kid and loved to play with it. That was, he had worked on the team that designed that. He also designed the very first plastic wastebasket. Up until that, they had been always been made out of steel. And so, and the fact that, you know, he graduated from right here in Carver in South Phoenix, I think is a great story. And so that's why I feel we should claim him as our own. For sure. Definitely. So, because he did so much great stuff and he spent several years here. Yeah, I'm I mean I'm glad to be like on a part of the project, a part of that project with you. And then one thing I just wanted to add in there uh is that Betty Fairfax actually taught at Carver High School as well. Oh, that's right. Yes, I remember reading that that she actually was that's what brought her here as well yeah. was to teach at Carver. And so actually Charles's father taught at Carver as well. Yeah. So that's how he wound up here. Yeah, so it's all it's all connected. <laughs> and you know and and Carver had a great arts program. I mean, I mean, there was Rip Woods. I mean, you've got a lot of famous artists that I think have kind of come out of there. Yeah. And so it's great to see. I know they've been doing some new things down at Carver, kind of trying to reinvigorate. Um, the school is right down on like 7th Street and Grant mm. and is just steps away from like the Herbert School of Fine Arts, where they are located now south of downtown. So, yeah. Very good. So I always like to pe ask people how they did, be, but I always tell them it doesn't matter how well you did at all. But all that's more important is the stories we shared and that now we know a little bit more and maybe have some new places to go visit. Oh, yeah, for sure. And so and maybe a chance to go to Festivus and kind of hang out a little bit <laughs> and see, because I know I know we'll be here until 10 o'clock tonight. Yeah, we'll be there. And even though it's chilly. You know, come on out. I know there'll be hot beverages around. There will be all kinds of things. So come on down and have some fun. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for being on this evening. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You are welcome. And let's go have some fun at Festivus. Oh, yeah. It's all right. Sad. Have a Can't great wait. night. You as well. Thank you. All right. Oh my gosh. That was so much fun. And you know, I've been wanting to do that shirt for like two years and suddenly Dylan made it happen. Oh my gosh. I am so excited to have that. So now you'll see why you should be sharing on Facebook because you want to share some of that love. All right. So now we have from the vault. And since we were kind of on a Carver theme, I thought we would stick with a Carver theme and talk about Something that's kind of hidden behind the school that most people don't even know is there. So back in 1963, a bomb exploded in a church in Birmingham, Alabama, killing four young girls. Now, John Waddell received recognition for a work that he created out of that called That Which Might Have Been, Birmingham, 1963. Now, the idea behind the work was really to portray those young women as adult women. And to really express that kind of senseless loss of potential that they could have achieved. Now, this work was, this work was first set up at the First Unitarian Universalist Church right here in Phoenix in the late 60s. A second casting was made and donated to Birmingham, Alabama. But they felt it was a little bit controversial. Because it was really depicting those young girls as nude women. And so Birmingham kind of really rejected that work of art. And so what they did was it went back. So it went to Carver. And so there was a little courtyard that you can't see from the outside the building but only through certain windows and being able to get out there. And so I love the fact that it's got a little bit of more hidden history tucked away to help explore Phoenix and kind of ourselves a little bit better. So check out Carver's website, see when they're doing another event and getting down there. 
so you can go visit and see what they've been doing. They've been busy getting that place ready to open back up again. All right. Well, next week we have a very exciting week as well. We have Carmela Ramirez, who is a local musician who has so much history here. So that's going to be a really good episode. So you'll definitely want to be sure and check that out. So that will be Thursday night right here at seven o'clock as well. So remember, if you have any questions, stories that you think would be great, maybe you've got someone who's like, hey, you know, you should talk to this person for happy hour. Let me know your thoughts. I am always happy to chat with folks because, you know, that's really where I get my best stuff is just from talking to all of you. I always want to give a shout out to definitely PJ Vader Baron, my cocktail advisor, supplying me now. As well as Chris and Cole, who did that amazing video that we start with. So thank you all so much for being here. Now we are going to leave with a plug for Festivus. That is Mayor Kate Gallego. As well as, oh, I'm, oh, is she in this one? I, oh, I don't remember if she's in this one. But um, it is talking about the fact that you can go online after Festivus and still do some local shopping. So everyone, have a great rest of your night. Hope we had a chance to see you here at Festivus. And enjoy, and I will see you next week. Hey, this is Ken Clark, founder of Festivus Market, reminding you this is our 12th year and we're going to be two nights in a row from now on, December 15th and 16th. And I'm Mark Shore, Arizona's Hip Historian, and I've been a vendor for all of those 12 years. I am so excited that we are going to be back in person right here. And, but you know, we've added more space, so there's more social distancing options. That's cool, and that's right. So also, the night after Festivus ends, the live market, we're going to be able to buy your favorite items on shoplocalfirst.com. You mean what? So people will be able to like yeah, buy one like of these online? Thing. Or maybe this yeah, one? Yeah, too. Or maybe this yes. one? Or maybe this one? Yes, all of those things. Wow! <laughs> December 15th and 16th, join us.